Um, we are in a series of sermons, and we are in the sixth or seventh week, and we're uh, looking at the biblical definition of love. The passage in 1 Corinthians 13 is one that I read at every single wedding, but it's not wasn't written directed to husbands and wives. It was just written directed to Christian love. And if there's anything that the world, the unbelieving world, thinks that Christians should show, it's it's love. But love is a weird word because the Bible says we have to love one another. We love our enemies, but we love our wives. And, and those are three different types of love for us. But the Bible uses the same exact word in the biblical language, the same exact word. It says to agape is the Greek word, your enemies, to agape one another, and to agape your wife. There are four biblical words for for love. One is where we get the word erotic. It's eros. That's an Old Testament word. It never shows up in the New Testament. Another is the word storge. It's a love uh, that, uh, that a parent has for a child. It does not show up in the New Testament. The other is the word philea, and it's we get Philadelphia from that, and that's the city of brotherly love. So it's a friendship kind of love. But more than nine out of ten times in the New Testament, it's translated agape. And agape is a willful, intentional, self-giving, not dependent on uh, feelings. First message that I preached in this is, is, according to the biblical definition of love, it's got nothing to do with feelings. Now, I'm so glad of the feelings that I have for my wife. And I'm not putting down feelings. I'm not putting down emotion. I, your, your marriage would, would be, be pretty lifeless without some type of feelings and emotion. I'm just telling you that when the Bible defines love, it doesn't have anything to do with feelings. But the world totally defines it as feelings. And I about killed the church the first sermon because I sang, You've lost. That love and feeling. But that's the way the world defines love. And that's why our divorce rate is so high. Because somehow we fall in love and fall out of love. And when I don't have that feeling anymore, whatever that feeling is, is that goosebumps, is that, I don't know what that is, but whatever that feeling is, I fall in it, I fall out of it. I mean, feelings come and go, right? I mean... Feelings are like the wave of an ocean. Sometimes they come in and they knock you down and you're overwhelmed with the feelings of emotion that you may have for someone or your spouse. But then sometimes, let's be honest, the wave goes out. And then sometimes the wave comes right back in again. Absolutely comes back in again. And if if we are dependent on feelings in our relationships one with another, whether that be with our spouse, whether that be with, with our friends or whether that be with our parents or whatever it may be, we're going to be like this up and down roller coaster in all of our relationships if we depend on feelings. But the Bible says plainly that love is an action. 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 4, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, says that love is patient. It's agape. It's a willful, self-giving, intentional act. Um, if you wait around for feelings of patience to come, you're going to be waiting a long time. You need, no, you, need no, you need no feelings of patience to be patient. You just need to do it. You can be patient by an act of your will. In fact, you can overcome impatience with an act of your will. The Bible says that love is patient, that love is kind. I don't have to have I don't have to have feelings of kindness to be kind to you. It's an act of my will. It's an act of my will. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does, love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Where Mike was last week, agape is not easily angered. Agape is angered. Agape does get angry but it's not easily angered. There are some things the Bible says we should be angry at. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Agape always protects. Agape always trusts. Agape always hopes. 
It always perseveres and love never fails. Your feelings will fail. They'll come and they'll go. When the Bible defines love, it has nothing to do with feelings. That's why I can agape my enemy and agape my wife. I mean, in, in, in the world's definition of that, it makes no sense whatsoever. But in the biblical definition of love, which is an intentional self-giving of yourself that has nothing to do with feelings, it's an act of the will, I can agape my enemy and I can agape my wife. Now, now hear me again. It has nothing, I'm not saying that, that any kind of relationship with love should not have feelings i hope it always does it just when paul decides to define love he doesn't use words that talk about feelings today i want to focus on fifth or sixth verse of first corinthians chapter 13 where it says love keeps no record of wrongs love is not a record keeper i've told you this before at every single wedding i read that passage uh, love is patient, love is kind. I read through those. But when I get to love keeps no record of wrongs, I turn to the, to the uh, groom and say, she will wrong you. I turn to the bride and say, he will wrong you. At that moment, you have the choice to love that person or not. And the Bible says that, that love keeps no record of wrongs, that love is not a record keeper every single in 26 years of ministry every single marital couple i've had in my office at least one of those partners and they're in there for marital difficulty at least one of those partners is a record keeper and most of the time it's two every single time um Harboring unforgiveness in your heart is not only the antithesis of anti-Christian living, it's just plain dumb. Can I talk that brash? It's, it's not healthy. It festers on the inside of Why would you do that to yourself? Why would you let that fester for months and for years inside of you? Why do you hate yourself so much that you would do that to yourself? Love just, unforgiveness just totally brings disruption into our lives. You know what it does? It ties us to the past, unforgiveness does. It ties us to some event, some person in the past. And you know what? That person's totally forgot about what they did. Totally forgotten about what they did. I'm not putting down what they did. I'm not saying, what they sh I'm not saying that what they did was you shouldn't be upset about that or anything. I'm not saying what they did wasn't wrong. I, I, I'm just saying you're tied to it and they've probably gone past it. You know what unforgiveness does? It pushes the pause button in your life and leaves you right there and does not allow you to continue to grow and mature because you're stuck back where that happened. Pushes the pause button in your life. We all love second chances, but what is it about human nature that doesn't want to give second chances to other people who have wronged us? Jesus says those second chances should number 70 times 7, and obviously that doesn't mean just 490. We well, think of the story of the prodigal son in, in Luke 15, and the prodigal son is a story that Jesus told. Now, whenever I say this next thing I'm getting ready to say, people will say to me, I didn't know that. But what I'm Because what I'm going to say is that parables that Jesus told, and, and the parable of the prodigal son is obviously one of those, they're made-up stories. 
that didn't really happen. Jesus made the story up to make a point. Now, that's fascinating because Jesus could have told any story that he wanted to to make this point because he's making it up after all. And we do that to our kids all the time. We, we talk in hypotheticals many times to try to make a point to them. And Jesus did the same thing because it's a good teaching strategy. And he says there was this uh, one son who asked his father, can I have my share in the inheritance? And the father gives it to him. So you know it's a made-up story right there. No father would ever, would a father would ever do that, right? And, and so the, the, the prodigal son goes off and takes his share of the inheritance and goes off and, 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 and wastes it all in wild living. And he, he ends up being broke, and he says he's so broke that he's, he's desiring to eat the food that the pigs eat. He's so, he's so hungry, okay? And he says, well, I need to go back to my father. He'll, he'll, he'll help me. And he goes back to his dad, and the dad sees him coming a long way off, which meant he was looking for him, uh, sees him a, a long way off, and puts the, kills the fatted calf, puts the robe that, that signifies that he's my son again, puts it back on him, and they throw a big party. And Jesus tells a made-up story to say that forgiveness brings celebration. Forgiveness brings celebration. But there's another story that happens in Matthew 18 of a, of a servant who owed a whole lot of money to his master. And, and that servant says, you know, I, I just, and, and the Bible says it's so much money he can never repay it. And so he says, please, would you forgive me of this debt? And you know it's a made-up story because the, the master forgives him of the debt. And, and, and then the servant goes and he goes to somebody that owes him money. And the Bible says he owes him a small amount of money. And he says, give me the money you owe me. And the guy begs for more time to pay off the debt. And he says, no, pay me now. And the master who forgave this servant of all of that money, hears of that, has the servant arrested and thrown into debtor's prison. See, Jesus made these stories up to say that forgiveness brings celebration, but unforgiveness brings bitterness and brings imprisonment. (laughs) Brings imprisonment. The story of the elder son in the, in the, in the prodigal story is, is someone who is who's imprisoned with bitterness toward his dad for treating his son that way and toward his, his brother because he got all this stuff and I've been here slaving for you all the time. Unforgiveness brings bitterness. It brings imprisonment. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many that bitterness that's inside of you festers it, it's it's a root that grows in you why would people do that to themselves why would people do that to themselves the bible says agape keeps no record of wrongs ephesians chapter 4 says in your anger do not sin. It's not the fact that you got angry. It's how your anger is displayed. In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger because if you do that, you'll let the devil in your life. Don't let the sun go down when you're angry. Don't turn over and, and sleep back to back because you're angry because you both just invited the devil into your life. You give the devil a foothold. Or you didn't do it intentionally, but what that bitterness and that unforgiveness does is just open wide the door for the devil to come in your life and exponentially grow that bitterness in your spirit. You've invited the devil in your life. Now, how stupid is that? Can I talk that brashly this morning? How how stupid why would people do that to themselves? In the story of the first family back in Genesis chapter 4, the whole Cain and Abel story that I, I don't have time to be able to go over for you, but the whole Cain and Abel story, God says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door it desires to have you you must 
rule over it. That bitterness, that unforgiveness is sin that desires to fester and to rule over you and to take control of your life and affect your decisions, you must rule over it. You must rule over it. John R. Rice was a great preacher of decades ago, and he wrote a quote. Uh, This is quoting him, and he's right on, friends. He's right on. Unforgiveness is choosing to stay trapped in a jail cell of bitterness, serving time for someone else's crime right on friends now can I say how stupid is that you are choosing to stay in a jail cell that you're serving time for something someone else did I could preach this message to a whole bunch of atheists. This, this, while it's certainly God stuff, it's biblical stuff. We have psychologists and, and psychologists that make a living talking to people about the unforgiveness in their life. This is just plain smart. If you're an atheist, this is just plain smart. But it's God stuff. It's stuff that the Lord has commanded us who have claimed the name of Christ that the love that we show for one another, for our enemies, and for our wives, it's not a record-keeping kind of love. Because if I'm a record-keeper, I'm just trapped in a jail cell serving time for someone else's crime. (laughs) Why in the world? Would I do that? The Christian life is a life of freedom. Jesus says, I have come that you would have life and have it more abundantly. And one of the ways you have life more abundantly, one of the ways you have it to the full, depending on what translation you read, is not to let unforgiveness fester in your spirit, to keep short accounts You can't have an abundant life. You can't have the life that Jesus wants if I'm harboring unforgiveness because that is not abundant life. And Jesus says, John 10, 10, I have come that you would have life. That's a fascinating statement, isn't it? Because he was talking to people who were alive. He says, you people who are alive, I have come that you would have life. You people who are alive, I have come that you would really live. And one of the ways that we live but really don't live is when we harbor unforgiveness in our spirit. Oh, I'm not minimizing. I'm not minimizing what that person did. Don't hear me. Because some of you are right now thinking, under, some of you in this room, under the sound of my voice, people listening on the live stream are saying, you know what they're saying? Yes, but he doesn't know what that person did to me. And you know what? I don't know. And I'm going to say something very brash again that some of you, it's going to rub some of you wrong. But as a pastor, yes, I don't know. But you know, you know what? Hear, hear me. Hear this in context of what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't know what you've been through. But I don't really care. I care about right now and how you're going to get through it. I care about this point on. I care about you letting it go. I care about you having life abundant. We can sit and talk for months about what that person did to you, and you're still stuck in the same hole. How are we going to get out of it? How are we going to get out of it? How are you going to let it go? How are you going to get over it? How are you going to forgive How are you going to get out of the jail cell where you're serving time for someone else's crime? That's my concern. I'm sorry you went through what you did. I'm sure it was horrible. I'm sure it was horrible. I'm sorry you had to go through it. But what are we going to do about it now? What are we going to do about it now?
Now, let me say something that's um, very scary. If you become a record keeper, you know what the Bible says? If you become a record keeper, God will be a record keeper as well for you. You know that? That if I'm a record keeper, God will be too. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15, that if I don't forgive, he won't forgive me. Well, what does that really mean? You know, we got to look at the interpretation and the context, and we got to look at the whole Bible. I know you do. I know you do. And I'm not sure how to rightly divide the Word of God there, and I'm not sure how, how to make that jive with a lot of passages is that we're saved by grace, and, and it's not of works, and it, it's a gift of God, but it's plain. You need no theologian to explain to you what that means. And the best biblical interpre- interpretation is taking it for what it means for what it says. And I'm not sure I understand this, but the Bible says, Jesus said, the Prince of Peace said, Mark, if you won't forgive, then your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. And I've heard people say, well, that means that if you really understand the forgiveness of God, then you'll extend that to other people. And maybe that's what it means. I don't know. I just know that that verse says, if I'm a record keeper, God will be too. Because he says, if I won't let it go, he won't let it go. That in some way that I can never understand to you, but I have to preach the hard verses to you just like I have to preach the verses that are comforting to you. Jesus said, somehow our forgiveness of other people is tied to his forgiveness of us. Wow. But Mark, but Mark, what about, yeah, I know, I know, but what about that in Ephesians? I know. But what about what Jesus says? If I'm a record keeper, if I'm a record keeper, Jesus, Heavenly Father will choose to be a record keeper as well. Now let me ask you a question. Why do people choose unforgiveness? Why, why, why are some of you in this room and, and people listening on the live stream, why are you struggling with unforgiveness? After all, it's stupid, right? <laughs> it, what good does it do you? How is it productive in your life? How is it productive? How is it maturing you? How is it making you more Christ-like? How is it making you a, a more loving person? How's it, ma- how, how's it making you a person that, that people want to be around more? Why do people choose unforgiveness? Well, after talking with a whole lot of people in 26 years of ministry, I've learned that some people... Some people feel like it's almost like a power game, that, that I've, I've got control over that person in some way, that I'm not going to give them my forgiveness, so I'm making that person pay that person who's already forgot about what you're worried about. I'm going to make that person pay. And in and, and, and this way, I have some power over them. Oh, I know what she did. I know what he did. I know he left you cold and he left you with three kids. I know about that. But why in the world would you hold on to it? How is it helping you to do that? Take take all the scripture out of it. Forget about the command that says that if you don't forgive others, the Heavenly Father won't forgive you. Forget about that for a second. I'm a secular psychologist right now. How is unforgiveness helping you? What's it doing for you? Is it making you more a loving grandmother? Is it making you more a loving father, a loving mother? Is it making you a better co-worker? Is it making you a better neighbor? Is it making you a better husband? Is it making you a better father? What's the purpose of it? Well, I got power over that person who's totally forgotten what they did. I'm in control. 
Why do people choose unforgiveness? Well, forgiveness is forgiveness is, is, is giving someone something that they don't deserve. In this whole world, we know that. You, you get what you deserve, right? You, you, you work 40 hours and you get a paycheck. You, you get what you deserve. You, you work hard to train yourself to, to, to uh, be strong and, and lift weights, and, and you gain muscle mass, and you can gain more weight. You, you, you get out of life what you put into life. You get what you deserve in life, and somehow it seems that forgiving someone is totally upside down to the way the world works. Well, how many times have I told you that the kingdom of God is upside down to the way the world works? Read the Sermon on the Mount. It is not the way the world works. It is not the way that worldly people think that the world works. And that's why Jesus just makes us scratch our heads sometimes. And that's why many people reject him. Because they, because they lean on their own understanding. Because we're such smart people. We got it all figured out. And the way of the world is, is more important than the way of God's word. And so we lean on our own understanding. Why do people choose unforgiveness? Because giving un, forgive, forgiving someone is giving some, someone something they don't deserve. And that kind of seems like it goes against stuff and the world thinking and so forth and so on. Why do people choose unforgiveness? It's because some people don't know how to forgive. They've bought into a lie. It's a cute little phrase. It's a trite little phrase. Somebody came up with it sometimes. It's certainly not biblical, but it sounds good. It sounds spiritual. When people say, well, you just got to forgive and forget. How can you forget that your husband walked out on you with three kids? How can you forgive that? How can you forget that? Well, just forgive and forget. Just forget it. And so people don't know how to do that because they don't know how to forget it because they think somewhere that it says in some book of the Bible, it says that you have to, when you forgive, that you're supposed to forget. And no one can forget what that person did to me. And the only way you can forget is for your brain not to work anymore. Well, Mark doesn't. Doesn't the Bible say that, that God remembers our sins no more? I don't think God forgets. What can God forget? It's just an illustration to say how he's put our sins behind his back, cast away as far as the east is from the west. Can't forget. So people say, I don't know how. I don't know how. I just can't forget it. Well, why do you think you're supposed to forget it? You're just not supposed to bring it up again. That's what forgiveness is. I will never, ever bring it up again. I've let it up. Oh, I still, it's still in there. Oh, it's still in there. I'll never, I'll never forget that. But I'll never, ever. I'll make the volitional choice, an act of my will, irregardless of my feelings, that I choose never to bring it up again. But so we have so many people at the altar, and it says, I just can't forget it. I just don't know how to do it because it's still in my mind. Of course it's still in your mind. But you don't have to bring it up again. That's an act of your will. That's agape. That's agape. And watch what God does. When you do not lean on your own understanding, take him at his word, don't bring it up again, put it behind you, let it go, make an intentional choice, never to utter that situation or that sin or that event again. Watch what 
God will do because you didn't lean on your own understanding. You took him at his word. And you've become a believer. And a believer is not only someone who believes there was a Jesus who died on the cross. A believer is one who takes him at his word and lives by the word of God. That's a believer. You're not believing if, you're not believing God if you're not forgiving people. You're not believing him. You're just flat out not believing him. You're leaning on your own understanding. You think you know more than God does. And how stupid is that? Forgive and forget? Are you kidding me? Do you know what some people have done to other people? And some counselor tells them to forgive and forget? I choose because of the agape love of God in me to never bring it up again. Never bring it up again. And I get up off of this, out of this altar or I leave the pastor's office. I'm never going to bring it up to him again. I'm never going to bring it up to her, her again. And I keep that. And when it comes to my mind and I want to bring it up again, my emotion and my feelings start to take over and I want to bring it up again, I say I left that at the altar. And I told him I'm never going to break it up, bring it up again. And I'm going to lean not on my own understanding, but I'm going to trust him. I'm going to believe him and just watch what God does for you. But you know what? We want to have the feelings of, un of forgiveness before we actually forgive. And it don't happen that way. You'll be waiting a whole long time if you're waiting for you to feel like forgiving him or feel like forgiving her. You'll be waiting a long time but just take him at his word and watch what he does. Why do people choose unforgiveness? <laughs> it's just flat out easier. <laughs> it's easier than working through it. It's easier than dealing with all the junk that's happened. It's easier than letting it go. It's easier than never bringing it up again. It's very human to bring it up again. It's very human to keep sticking that knife in her back. It's very human to do that supernatural to do the other it takes the holy spirit of god to do the other it's easier to walk by the flesh it's easier to walk by the natural than to walk by the spirit of god and deny myself when those feelings of those human feelings rise in my spirit and i said i'm not going to trust those feelings right now i'm going to trust you and you've told me to let it go it's just easier it's just easier to harbor unforgiveness. Flat out easier. Each Sunday, we finish our service at the table, at the altar, or however you choose to receive communion. And when we receive communion, we are remembering that on the cross, Jesus kept no record because he says in Romans 5, 8, while you were still a sinner, I died for you. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Every single time we receive communion, we're remembering that God has not been a record keeper. And Colossians 3 something says forgive as the Lord forgave you. How in the world, how arrogant of me to harbor unforgiveness to one of you all or to someone else after what God has forgiven me of. How stupid is that? And the only reason I can do that if I have no clue of God's forgiveness of me, his complete unforgiveness, for, 
complete forgiveness of me. If I don't truly understand that, then maybe I could har harbor unforgiveness about somebody. But if I know that I'm walking in complete freedom, that everything has been forgiven, how in the world could I not forgive you? And if you understand that, how in the world could you not forgive me? Our servers are coming to the table. Father, in some ways this is Christianity 101, but some ways it's pretty deep stuff too. Because the hurts that have happened to us, there, there's wounds there. And those wounds are a lot worse than they should be because we've held on to it for a long time. And Lord, it's, it's, it's time for some people under the sound of my voice to let it go. To choose by an act of their will never to bring it up again. To, to choose to no longer hurt themselves. To, to no longer have the pause button on in their life. To no longer be serving time in jail for someone else's crime. Give us the grace to trust you in this instance and not lean on our own understanding. Help us now as we come to the table in Jesus' name. Amen. You have choices of the altar or the tables. Or in just a moment, I'll lead you through communion right there in your seat.